19 cars are due to line up for today's second leg of the global Mazda MX-5 Cup Challenge here at Sebring International Raceway. 19th position on the grid is Michael Globe for slipstream performance in car number 12. Moving into the ninth row of the grid, Racer Kashima from Japan for Coppola Motorsports in car number 7. Alongside for six sideways racing in car number 23, the eSports world champion Glenn McGee. Not quite sure why he qualified so far back because he was certainly very competitive in yesterday's race. Also much farther back on the grid than we would have expected. This year's uh, battery tender global MX-5 Cup champion, car number 01 for slipstream performance is Nico Rega back in 16th position on the grid. Alongside him from Russia, Moise Uretsky in car number 55 for McCombie Macalier Racing. Row 7, Tyler Gonzalez, one of the two 14-year-olds in the race for Copeland Motorsports in car number 57. And the lone female in the race, Ashton Harrison in car number 03 for six sideways. Row 6, Soshiro Yoshida in car number 50 for long road racing. Alongside former champion of this event two years ago when the race was held at what was then Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca. Nathaniel Sparks in car number 8 for six sideways. Row 5, Thomas Bernacki for Copeland Motorsports in car number 95. His teammate alongside him from Puerto Rico is Brian Ortiz. Row 4, Drake Kemper in car number 99 for six sideways racing. And his teammate, Robert Noaker, 14 years old, won his first race of the championship this season at Mid-Ohio in car number 13. Also for six sideways, Celine Roland in car number 87 will start in the sixth position alongside Brian Henderson in car number 97 for Atlanta Speedworks. Two more of his teammates will be alongside each other on the second row of the grid. Car number 84 driven by Todd Lamb and in the third position, having set the fastest lap yesterday in the first race of the weekend, car number 77, the veteran Andy Lally. And on to the front row, a magnificent win yesterday for a 23-year-old Yui Tsutsumi in car number 11 for long road racing. And on the pole Position having led every lap except for the final one yesterday. Sebring resident, the team principal at Six Sideways Racing, uh, former champion in the Global MX5 Cup, is John Dean II in car number 16. That is our starting lineup, Tony Laporta. You're right, you are, Jeremy. Sebring, Florida, the site of the 2018 Battery Tender Global MX5 Cup Challenge presented by BF Goodrich. It was great racing yesterday, and Jeremy, I heard a great quote from PR whiz kid, Matt Clary, who was talking to Andy Lally. The quote is actually belonging to Lally, but Matt passed it on to me. Lally, after the racing yesterday, summed up MX-5 Cup racing as USF 2000 racing with fenders. What do you make of that quote? Yeah, well, yes, uh, I, you, can, you can kind of use a bit of uh, scare tactics more in these cars, perhaps, because if you tangle wheels, you're not going to go upside down, most likely. You're just going to bend a little bit of bodywork. Don't think it was much uh, bodywork bent yesterday. Surprisingly, little contact. Uh, between the leading contenders, but some very, very tight racing and just a brilliant pass on the final lap uh, by uh, Yui Tatsumi to take the win from John Dean. John Dean, I guess he'd been having a few braking difficulties with that car during the race, and he was a little bit conservative going into the final corner. That's the, the one opportunity that Yui Tatsumi needed. Uh, champion this season in the MX-5 Global Cup cars in Japan, and uh, he showed why he's a champion by moving, making a great pass or lead on the inside going into the final corner. Well, there was no uh, there was no contact there. Uh, we right. spoke to John Dean's dad uh, in the break there. No contact. Contact, uh, a wheel bearing maybe just causing him a bit of a problem. Now, for those people, Tony, who are joining us today who maybe didn't see the race yesterday, and if you haven't, you, you really do need to go and have a look at that on the video or audio archives that are available. The result from yesterday is crucial to what we're going to see today because we're looking for the lowest score. This is Master MX-5 Golf, basically. The lowest score wins... And after the 45 minutes today, somebody's got to do that arithmetic and try and put that together. So the way that they finished yesterday isn't how they're going to line up today. They qualified for these positions, but basically the top six are the guys who are most likely to take home a share of that 80 grand that's up up for grabs. 80 grand in cash, by the way. You don't have to spend it on motor racing. You don't have to spend it on Mazda. You can take it and have a holiday in the Caribbean if you want to. But 80 grand going to the split between the top three, 50, uh, uh, 50 20, 10. Exactly, John. You know, you did a great job summing that all up. You could have a real career in this race announcing <laughs> thing. Uh, I don't know. 
John is exactly right. It's it's eighty thousand dollars cash is the total purse up for grabs from our friends at Mazda. Fifty thousand dollars going to the winner of the event. Twenty grand going to the second place finisher, and ten grand going to the third place finisher in the event. And why we say event is because, as John talked about, race one already ran yesterday afternoon into the evening. Today, race number two, and it's an aggregate. It's a low score win, so it's a point based. Uh, finish. First place, second place, you earn one more point each position down the grid that you finish. And the driver with the lowest amount of points, once it's all said and done, will be crowned the event winner. So once this race is over, we'll go back down to Sebring's victory lane. We'll hand out some trophies for the drivers that finish on the podium in race number two, which is rolling out on the track right now. But then we'll clean off the podium, we'll reset, and we'll bring out the checks, the money that we're going to award to the drivers that finish P1, P2, and P3 in the event. And one important thing to note, Tony, is in the event of a tie break, it's the better result in race two yes. that will carry the day. Exactly correct. And as John mentioned earlier, race one yesterday did not set the starting grid for this race. Qualifying, which happened early yesterday morning, fastest lap in qualifying set your starting position for race one. Second fastest lap in qualifying set the grid for race number two. So that's how they'll line up. John Dean was able to or score a double pole position qualifying yesterday morning. He started the race from pole yesterday. He'll start the race from pole today, Jeremy. Indeed so. And uh, it's surprising to me that uh, several contenders uh, maybe didn't understand the rules because uh, Glenn McGee and Nico Riga in particular, a long, long way down the grid in 16th and 17th positions. They are two of the uh, fastest drivers out there, but they've got, uh, got the, a lot of work to do to make their way through the pack. Looked like Michael Globe in kind of a 12 uh, didn't come around on that first formation lap, so it looks like we're going to have uh, 18 cars for the start of this race, but I'll tell you what, uh, judging by the competitiveness of yesterday evening, this is going to be a cracker, and this is where the money is paid. Yesterday was a, a kind of a warm-up for many of these guys, uh, certainly for someone like Andy Lally, who's not used to driving this sort of car uh, in competition. Uh, but he did a fantastic job, and he, he finished in the sixth position right with the lead pack yesterday and set the fastest lap of the race on the final lap of the race. So he's kind of a, on, a, on a swing at the moment, and he's going to be looking to make a fast start and mix it among those two leaders. But he's got right behind him his two Atla Atlanta Speedworks teammates, the team principal Todd Lamb and Brian Henderson also. They're lining up directly behind him on the grid in the uh, fourth and fifth positions and drafting is so important here tony and teamwork is important if you can get uh, two cars or even three cars in a, in a train you can uh, you can make up quite a lot of ground on the on the guys guys around you bump drafting is very definitely a factor in these cars absolutely jeremy these big full-bodied mx5 cup cars again i love that quote that matt clary passed it to me on about uh, what andy lally thought about them uh, f2000 cars with fenders is how andy describes these battery tender global mx5 cup cars but folks it's been a great season of racing again promoted by the folks at Anderson promotion sanctioned by the staff at IndyCar uh, Global MX-5 Cup Racing enjoying its second year of this new marriage between IndyCar and Anderson it's been really fantastic results both on and off the track and of course none of it happens without John Doonan and his staff at Mazda $200,000 going to the champion this year which was Nico Rieger who is in the 0-1 car he suffered some transmission issues yesterday Jeremy I was told the car was stuck in fourth gear when we saw him peel off going into turn number one and then Celine Roland who unfortunately suffered uh, a drive through penalty after contact with Todd Lamb. He left the season $75,000 richer thanks to Rookie of the Year honors. So Mazda certainly promoting their drivers towards a career in motorsport. Oh, it's in absolutely incredible what Mazda has done for the sport of motor racing in North America over the last uh, dozen or so years. Uh, they've helped a lot of people uh, make uh, very good careers for themselves and continue to do so. And they came up short in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship this season in terms of a race win, but they finished off the season really, really strong with a, a, a second and third at Petit Le Mans at the end of the season. And that's what many of the drivers in this field those are their aspirations to be driving for the Mazda prototype team in the years to come. Absolutely. So you see the Mazda MX-5 Cup pace car driven by Gail Truess. Speed away from the pack heading into turn number 17. IndyCar chief starter Paul Blevin has guests in the starter stand ready to instruct them to give the green flag, which will kick off race number two. He's pounding his chest. He's feeling the intensity. Our guest starter knows it's about to get intense. Jeremy John Dean on the outside. And yesterday's winner, you used to see me on the inside which will flip-flop when they get to corner number one, but the field now coming out 
of turn 17, waiting to see the green flag as it flies. And we're racing for the second and final time here in Sebring, Florida. It's a drag race too wide and a bunch of rows deep as 45 minutes of racing is underway. John Dean's able to clear the pack just enough as he gets a clear shot into turn number one. And that's the 77 of Andy Lally, who you talked about laying down some very fast laps at the end of race one yesterday. He's already up to third place. Yeah, and uh, it, you had Susumi there was kind of left at the start line by John Dean. And John Dean's already got uh, two or three car lengths over Susumi, who just about holds on to second place. I think that might have been, was that Todd Lamb just sneaking ahead of Landy Lally at turn three as well? Certainly it's uh, close there between third and fourth positions as Susumi just uh, strays a wheel off onto the dirt there, but he is in second place. It's John Dean who leads toward the hairpin. You're exactly right, uh, Jeremy. It is Andy Lally, the team principal over there at Atlanta Speedworks. He leads his teammate, Andy Lally. So it's Todd Lamb in third, Lally in fourth. And then it's another one of their team cars right there, the number 97 behind them. There's a good shot of the sole red Mazda driven by Celine Roland. And to folks who might not have caught our race yesterday, when you see a Mazda with the sole red paint scheme on it, that signifies that driver is racing uh, as a benefit of scholarship money. Uh, the number 87 driven by Celine Roland, a benefactor of the Mazda scholarship shootout last winter. He got the scholarship money, which ensured him to race this season, and he made good usage of it, winning Rookie of the Year honors. Pack now coming out of turn 10 through 11 and 12. John Dean out in front. He dominated the races we talked about, Jeremy. Started from the pole position, led nearly every single time they came across the stripe, but it was a very masterful move by the driver who would ultimately score the win, Yui Tsusimi, who I have to give credit where credit is due. Shea Adam, who was participating in the audience of our race broadcast yesterday, corrected me, and I appreciate it so much when I said that Tsusimi was here making his debut in the United States racing. He actually competed in this event two years ago, and I think, uh, if I remember correctly, Shea stated that he finished fifth. So we really appreciate the racing encyclopedia that is Shay Adam uh, tuning in and watching the broadcast and letting us know what's up even when she's not here. Uh, but he currently sits in second place, heading down to turn 17 where he made his move on John Dean. And it was a masterful one, Jeremy. If there was any contact at all, which I don't believe there was, it was the most minimal contact you'd ever see for a pass for the win. Yeah, I don't think there was at all. It was just a great move. And there was a, there was a, 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 a slight opening to the inside and Suzumi took it and came away with the win by, uh, by uh, just fractions of a second. This time around, it's John Dean who leads. He's got about uh, two or three car lengths over to Sumi, and then there's two Atlanta Speedworks cars, Todd Lamb and Andy Lally, tucked in behind each other, one behind the other in third and fourth positions. A little bit of gap back then to the number 70, uh, 97 car. That is the other Atlanta Speedworks car with Brian Henderson at the wheel. And then you see John Dean, he's out in front for six sideways racing, but then behind him, we catch that pack right there. It's three of his team cars, uh, the 13 of Robert Nowaker, the number eight of Nathaniel Sparks, and the 87 of Celine Roland. He's got a bunch of his team cars all over each other, really leaning on each other as they battle for what would be about sixth, seventh, and eighth here on lap number two. And 45 minutes may sound like a long race for these cars, folks, but it's really not a lot of time at all. And we watched uh, the couple of the six sideways drivers, uh, including Ashton Harrison and John Dean, give a radio interview at the beginning of this week. And the host asked him, you know, what's it like out there for 45 minutes? Do you get tired? Do you get worn down? And John said, listen, when you're leading the race, it seems like much too long of a, of a yes. time. But when you're in second, it's never enough. So uh, the good news is no one ever stays in the lead for long. But boy, John Dean put on a performance yesterday, much like he did at Road America, Jeremy, where he really just dominated and most importantly, importantly, I think, set the pace of the race, which as the leader is easy to do. That's right. And uh, if the if the we do, talked about earlier on, there's an aggregate result here but on points, not on time or anything like that. It's just a point. So you get one point for winning, two points a second and on down the order. It's the lowest uh, aggregate point total that will win the $50,000. Right now, uh, the positions are reversed from yesterday. The car that finished second yesterday is in the lead. The car that won yesterday is in second place. If they finish uh, as they are right now, and we're still, we've only just started this race, which is a 45-minute race, uh, they would be equal, tied on three points. It will be today's result yep. that is the tiebreaker. Exactly. So John Dean make, needs to make sure that uh, if he stays where he is right now, he's, he's golden and looking at a very, very impressive payday. Exactly. Jeremy set it up perfectly. If the results were as they are right now at the checkered flag, the tiebreaker goes to race two's results. So whoever has the better result in race two, the race you're watching right now, that is who the tiebreaker would go to. Sasimi won yesterday. He runs second currently. Todd Lamb leads his teammate, 
Andy Lally in fourth. Henderson sits in fifth. Celine Roland, Robert Noaker, Brian Ortiz, Drake Kemper, and Nathaniel Sparks. They are literally the bottom half of the top ten, and they have traded positions almost every corner. There's a good shot at the lead pack running down the front straightaway. John Dean way up high to driver's right-hand side before he dives down to the left in a very long turn number one here at Sebring International Raceway. They make their way out of corner number one. They make the quick little dogleg right-handed turn number two before setting up for the left-hander corner number three. Nathaniel Sparks working on the inside of his teammate, Celine Roland. Sparks is there, and he's through. So Sparks up a position that should put him to ninth, bumping Roland now down to P10. But believe me, they're not going to stay like that for long, probably not even the rest of this lap. The field coming now out of four and five. They'll make their way around that long right-handed lazy bend that is turn number six before flying underneath the mobile one bridge and then hard on the brakes, Jeremy, into the hairpin turn number seven. It's a quick little chicane out of that before they make it up to turns eight and nine. Uh, and you're really busy in a lap here at Sebring International Raceway. We had Oliver Askew uh, join me in the booth for qualifying. He talked a lot about how this track isn't just one it's, it's not just a fast track, and it's not just a technical track, it's both. It is, and it's bumpy in places as well. I mean, there's all sorts of uh, uh, characteristics of this racetrack you don't get at many other racetracks around the country. It's a, it's, it is a unique racetrack, and it's why everybody loves coming here to Sebring International Raceway, either to watch or to drive. We've got this four-car train there at the front. It was uh, Todd Lamb who actually set the fastest lap last time around, 1 minute 29.5. Uh, uh, which is almost identical, but fractionally quicker than the race leader, John Dean. And that's actually about a half a second quicker than John Dean managed in the whole of yesterday's race. So that shows you the pace that had been set at the front of the field, the battle for fifth on back. And uh, right at the back of the field at the moment, having obviously made a mistake on the first lap, uh, was uh, Tyler Gonzalez. He had slipped right the way to the back of the field in kind of 57. One of the 14-year-olds, uh, two 14-year-olds in this race, the other one being Robert Noeka, who's running in car number 13 in the seventh position. But Tyler Gonzalez looking, uh, making his car racing debut this weekend, being a bit of a star in karting. He's looking to wake his way back up through the field. A pair of 14-year-olds. I said it yesterday, Jeremy, but when I was 14, I couldn't even spell MX-5 Cup. And now these two drivers are out here battling around one of the most historic and famous road courses in American sports car history. Good battle right there as the Puerto Rican number four, Brian Ortiz, leads drivers like Drake Kemper, Robert Noaker, Celine Roland, and Nathaniel Sparks. That's kind of been the hornet's nest that just hasn't calmed down. They fly across the start-finish line right in front of us, too wide. Henderson in the number 97 wants to make it three wide, getting down into turn number one as they battle for the bottom half of the top ten. Drake Kemper's going to put his Lemons of Love, number 99 MX-5 Cup car, to the head of that pack. So now he is out in front. He'll occupy the fifth position. That's Drake Kemper. Fifth on back is the Hornet's Nest that you see right behind him. Kemper's got the spot. Brian Ortiz in that white and green entry for Copeland is now back to sixth. Nathaniel Sparks is battling with his teammate Robert Noaker. Noaker in the number 13 on the inside. Now the track will go back to the right. Sparky on the inside. But Kemper sits fifth and Ortiz in sixth. Boy, no acre and Sparks not slowing down at all as they make the run out of turn six. Now down the short shoe, setting up for turn number seven. A little bit farther back, that is the fight for 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th. Literally the whole bottom half yeah. of the top 10, Jeremy, all over themselves. And that little chicane right out of turn 7, whoever designed that corner really, really had some ill intentions because cars have run off almost every single time. And you just, you come out of that right-hander in 7 and you've got that left-handed curve right there. And it seems the track disappears almost instantly as a lot of the drivers in this pack just found themselves driving through a bit of dirt and dust. But... Uh, things calm now for the moment up at the front, but boy, fifth on back is a very busy place to be. Yeah, and those the lead, leading quartet, I think, uh, I fancy none of them will be willing really to make a move at this stage in the race. If they can stay where they are and just keep those four cars well clear of everybody, everybody else, then they can sort it out in the closing stages. And let those guys behind are battling amongst themselves hold each other up on the last lap round. Brian Henderson in the third of the Atlanta Speedworks cars, he fell from fifth position all the way down to ninth in one lap. Uh, and that is what all that shuffling around the positions, that's going to slow everybody else up and going to allow those four leaders to pull away. Then they can concentrate on the final 
final few minutes of this race and go for that $50,000. Watching a good battle right now just outside of the top 10. That's Yoshida in the white number 50. Another one of our Japanese drivers coming over to compete in the Global Challenge. And he's racing with Atlanta, Georgia's Ashton Harrison in the red 03 with the pink roll cage. Ashton right there peeking out to the outside of Yoshida as they head into turn 17. Yoshida seems to have the position for now. But again, Ashton Harrison, even though she's from Atlanta, Georgia, just up the East Coast here in the United States, she drives for Six Sideways Racing, whose shop is a mere four miles down the road. So Harrison's been here and has benefited a lot of te from a lot of testing as there's a fight for the lead. It's to see me to the inside down in turn number one. Boy, the 16 of John Dean isn't just going to let him have it. Hangs tough on the outside. He's going to benefit from this right-handed turn number two right here. So he gets the lead back only for a moment there. Two by two. You see me to the inside, Jeremy, in turn three. Oh, but Dean in the grass. Contact to see me goes around. And John Dean stays in the gas. The 11 sits in the grass in turn number three. What do you make of that? I reckon that's going to be a penalty. There's certainly the uh, race officials are going to be looking at that. He was across the grass, came back on the racetrack. That was certainly an unsafe return to the racetrack by John Dean. Uh, and at this stage in the race, that's just not a move he needed to make. He could, if he, there should have been no problem for him to give out that position at this stage. Just don't lose too much time. But by coming, when he came back on the track, he hit quite clearly the car of Tasumi there. And Tasumi had to absolutely done nothing thing wrong and I'd be well certainly the officials would be looking at that and I would be surprised if there wasn't a penalty but that's a great shame because that's not how you want to one of these races to finish particularly not so early in the proceedings and if you notice there was a second car involved in that incident when that pack of fifth through tenth rolled up it was the 13 that's John Dean's driver Robert Noaker the 14 year old out of Pennsylvania so that contact having even more negative results than John Dean could have ever imagined and his young teammate getting involved in that incident as well as 5th through 10th rolled up on that uh, spin. The 11 car was parked to the outside in turn number 3. Wow, that was uh, very dramatic here early on. And I made the comment on the drive-in this morning, Jeremy, with Gail Truess, our pace car driver, and Paul Blevin, our chief starter. I said, well, it's been such clean racing yes. so far this weekend. And Gail said, you bite your tongue. <laughs> and she was exactly right, uh, because not only is it the last race of the day and the weekend, but it's the $50,000 deciding race. So you had to know the intensity was going to pick up. But Jeremy, honestly, I do agree with you. John Dean did such a good job of maintaining composure and setting the pace during yesterday's first first race you think he could have sat a little bit longer in second position with Tassimi. Meanwhile, he challenged, he's getting challenged for the lead once again here, and he won't put up a fight as Todd Lamb is pushed by for the lead with his teammate Andy Lally right in second. Now Lally's going to dive to the inside. Lally says, hey, bud, I'm glad I could help you get to the lead. I'm going for it now. And John Dean pulls off and hits pit lane. We have to assume that's by the instruction of Kyle Novak and IndyCar Race Control to serve a drive-through penalty. There's a great shot of our leaders coming down to the right-hand side. Where's Tsumi? He, he never got collected. He never got going again. Of course again. he did. Yes, right. he was involved in the incident. So yeah. we see the 16 of John Dean pass us underneath the starter stand. Of obviously is serving a drive-through penalty, we must assume. So that hands a lead over to the Atlanta Speedworks cars. Andy Lally now in the number 77, setting the pace with his team owner, Todd Lamb, in the number 84 in second. Wow, and in just one lap, Jeremy, everything changes. It certainly does. And these two leaders now, they're going to work together to pull away. Now, whoever wins this race does not automatically win the $50,000. No. Uh, and uh, so th th there's going to be a lot at stake here because, of course, there was only one penalty issued in yesterday's race. That was to Celine Roland for punting off Todd Lamb, who uh, came back to finish yesterday in the uh, eighth position. Andy Lally was in sixth. So the guy who's looking good right now for the $50,000 is, is uh, Nate Sparks, Sparky in car number eight. He's running in third position at the moment. And uh, on aggregate results, uh, I think he is uh, looking pretty good right now. But uh, the two Atlanta Speedworks entries, they're going to work together here now. They, they're, I'm sure they're not going to be worried about shuffling positions. They just want to put their heads down and try and extend their advantage over that uh, pursuing pack of cars. That incident on the last lap uh, cost them a fair bit of time because the gap as they came across the start finish line on the previous lap was almost three seconds between the top four and the rest of the field. When they crossed the finish start finish line uh, on this on this lap, it was down to two seconds. So they pulled up a full second 
on that leading duo. So the, the first two cars, they are teammates. They want to work together, use their draft, and try and make sure they can extend their lead once again over this pack right behind them. Drama unfolding early here in race number two of the Global MX-5 Cup Challenge at Sebring International Raceway. It didn't take long this morning for the dollar signs to start replacing the breaking points out around the racetrack. And now Andy Lally finds himself at the very sharp end of this MX-5 Cup field. He's got the 2009 Series Champion and his team owner, Todd Lamb, right behind him. And then it's a host of six sideways cars. Nathaniel Sparks, Drake Kemper, Celine Roland, Brian Ortiz, uh, Brian Henderson, Thomas Bernanke, Yoshida, and Harrison round out the top 10. Celine Roland getting a little sideways on the exit of turn 17, trying to make something happen. He's door to door with Brian Ortiz. Ortiz picked up race one of the year. Roland scored the win in race number two. So those two drivers, Jeremy, very used to racing very close to each other. Drake Kemper out in front of them right now while Brian Henderson watches the battle in front of him. But yeah, the Atlanta Speedworks cars now finding themselves at the very front end of the field for the first time this weekend and boy what a difference one lap can make as they headed in to turn number two uh john dean who was fighting for the lead with yesterday's winner sasimi makes contact with the driver of the number 11 sasimi goes around in turn number three ends up in the dirt the crash also ends up collecting one of the six sideways drivers 14 year old uh, Robert Noaker, and then only a lap later, John Dean pulling off onto pit lane to serve what we have to imagine is a Kyle Novak ordered drive through penalty. Sometimes the uh, penalty fits the crime pretty perfectly. I think that one does as well because the 11 of Tosimi wasn't sidelined. He wasn't knocked out of the race. He won't. He won't score a DNF. He is back on track. He's currently running in the 15th position. He's pretty much guaranteed to be out of the running for the $50,000 at this point. But John Dean handed that drive through penalty. That's going to take him out of the running as well. So I think race control nailed it on that one. And the penalty fits the crime nearly perfectly. Yeah, it really does. That was a certainly an error there from John Dean. And surprising that somebody of his experience should make it, quite frankly. Because I think at this stage in the race, he has the experience to know that a little bit of patience there would have been... Uh, uh, would have served him well. But uh, in the meantime now, uh, Sparky in car number eight uh, is, uh, has got his head down. He's also driving for that six sideways racing team based right here in Sebring, Florida. And he is closed up onto the tail of the two Atlanta Speedworks entry. And Sparky, he, he started in this race in 11th position. So clearly he is absolutely charging now and up into third position right now behind Todd Lamb. And the leader still Andy Lally. Yeah, wow. Nathaniel Sparks has done a great job, Jeremy, of reeling in these two leaders. They come out of 16 and make the run down the back straightaway. The two Speedworks cars of Lally and Todd Lamb drop way down to the lower third of the back straightaway knowing that they can't give Sparks an inside run. Something falls out, it looks like, of the 77 or perhaps the 84. Uh, they continue down into corner number 17, a very long, a very bumpy, a very technical corner that you must nail the exit of if you want a successful run down the start-finish straightaway into corner number one. But now we look out of our window. Here come the leaders, the 77, the 84, and the number eight. Does Sparky make a move? He's got momentum on his side. I think it wouldn't hurt him to take a look on the inside of the 84, but no, both Atlanta Speedworks cars stay way down to the inside. Sparky says, that's all right. I'll go around the outside. Sparky taking the fight for second place right to Todd Lamb. They're door-to-door -door out of turn two. And Jeremy, Andy Lally's looking at his mirror going, oh my goodness, it's really picking up back there right now. Lally's still your leader. Yeah, it is, but uh, this is, this is going to be a bun fight now. We've got, all of a sudden got six cars battling for the lead. And not too far behind them also is Brian Henderson. He's going to try and uh, join that pack if he possibly can as well. But at the moment, uh, the two Atlanta Speedworks guys, they've got their hands full with Sparky right in the middle of the action. I'll tell you what, this is a uh, about a seven car train up at the front fighting for the lead as Todd Lamb pulls out of the draft, not to attempt a pass on the 77 of Lally, maybe just to get a little bit of cool air into the radiator of that MX-5 Cup car. But Jeremy, this is a, a very intense pack we're watching right now. Still over 25 minutes of racing to go. Andy Lally, the sports car veteran, leading the way right now. His teammate Todd Lamb behind him. Nathaniel Sparks, the champion from two years ago, sitting in third. Arts our rookie of the year, Celine Roland, currently in fourth. And Drake Kemper in the number 99 
uh, rounds out the top five. Well, no, they've already shuffled That's positions right. from the last time I looked. Now Kemper's up to third. Your top two have not changed. It's still Lally and Todd Lamb. Kemper now in third. It looks like Celine Roland's come up to fourth. And Drake Kemper doesn't even want me to say he's in third. He fights for second now as they come out of turn 13. They're door to door. Celine Roland and Drake Kemper now, Jeremy. And the, the race leader, Andy Lally, his last two lap times, absolutely identical. Two minutes, uh, 30. 0.94 seconds to the hundredth of a second. That's how uh, Andy Lally is driving this car absolutely flat out. And those guys behind him just taking advantage of the draft to pull in closer again and make this now a, a tremendous six car battle. Folks, if you take heart medication, you Seven should probably battle. pop it by now because this race is not calming down anytime soon. Nathaniel Sparks just hung on the inside of Celine Roland's body work so closely, Jeremy, as they work through that right handed complex. I'm uh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, the left-handed complex turned 15 before getting down into turn 16. Sparks hung right there perfectly on Celine Roland's left side, driver's side door, uh, and he does it with absolute precision, knowing what he can get away with. Sparky, a very accomplished driver in this category. Celine Roland, yeah, he's only a rookie. He's scored victories. He fought for a championship up till the very end. He's no rookie anymore after one year in the sport. Now, Drake Kemper, a former series champion, pulls out along to the inside. He's definitely going to be able to grab second spot away from the 84 of Todd Lamb as they get to the exit of turn number one. They're side by side. I say he's definitely going to be able to get it, and it's still a dogfight. They head to the right-hander. Turn number two, the track will bend to the left again in turn number three. You'd think that would make it an easy shot for Kemper, but no. Todd Lamb stays in the gas, throws the right side. BF Goodrich is over the curbing, catches a little bit of air. They're still side by side, folks. Todd Lamb holds on for third and is able to not lose too many more positions, but now you break up that Atlanta Speedworks top two that we've seen almost all race, Jeremy, as Drake Kemper puts the six sideways, number 99 entry into second, trying to run down Andy Lally, and he's going to try to bring his teammate, Nathaniel Sparks, along with him. No, Todd Lamb's still able to hold on for third. Meanwhile, behind them, it's two by two sideways through the chicane. Yeah, six sideways uh, and other teams as well. Talking to six sideways, the team principal John Dean having served that penalty. He's just gone and set the fastest lap of the race here. Two minutes, 29.067 at the back of the field. That's two seconds quicker than these guys are running at the front. That's what I meant yesterday. I, I thought he seemed to have things in control. He's way, way down the order in 17th position, but uh, he's absolutely flying, but uh, out of contention now. Well, don't tell anyone just yet, Jeremy, but look who he's right behind. The driver, the number 11, yeah. who is the uh, driver he offended that awarded him the penalty, and the driver he ran second to across the start finish line in yesterday's race number one that's Yui Tsushimi who scored the victory in race one yesterday so just a little bit of uh, irony or maybe poetic justice I'm not sure to see those two right next to each other on the leaderboard of course they're much out of the running for this race uh, with 23 minutes still to go the pack coming through turn 15 setting up wide for that dive into corner 16 which is again a very crucial momentum corner you must get a good run out of that if you want to be set up perfectly for the back straightaway into turn 17 now it's Sparky pulling to the inside of his teammate, Celine Rolon. That's going to be the battle for probably fourth on track. Lally still leads. It's Drake Kemper in second. Kemper doesn't want to make a move yet. And then it's going to be Sparky in third. Todd Lamb back to fourth. There's your front pack heading down into turn 17. They'll unwind the steering wheel slowly over the bumps as they unwind out of corner 17 and make the run down the start finish line. This will complete lap number nine here at Sebring. They see the crossed flags from Paul Blevin halfway home in this 45-minute race number two here at the Global MX-5 Cup Challenge. Lally leads him into turn number one. In second, it's Drake Kemper, his teammate. Nathaniel Sparks right behind him in third. It looks like Todd Lamb still right there in fourth, doing a great job at not losing the pack. Lamb looking high, now looking low as they head to turn three. Not close enough. Sparky defends on the entry into the left-hander, corner number three. Todd Lamb still in fourth. Celine Roland rounds out the fast five. Brian Ortiz trying to make something happen in sixth. Then it's Brian Henry Henderson in seventh, Thomas Bernacki in eighth, Rieger and Yoshida round out your top ten as the field sets up for the hairpin, corner number seven. Lally has them covered now, Jeremy, but it's not going to stay that way for long. It isn't, and uh, the uh, the overall positions are changing lap by lap as well. The top three finishers from yesterday, Yui Tsutsumi in car number 11, Dean John Dean in car number 16, Robert Noeker in car number 13. They've all had problems in this race. They're at the very back of the field. They're really not in contention for the $50,000. It's right now between Nate Sparks, Jake Kemper, and Andy Lally. They finished yesterday in fourth, fifth, and sixth.
sixth right now. Those three run in uh, th in, the, in the lead, Andy Lally. In second place, Drake Kemper. And uh, in third place is Nate Smart. So those top three, that is the battle for the lead of this race and effectively for the $50,000 as well. Right now, it would be uh, Drake Kemper, who is in the, uh, in, the, in the best seat in the house in second position at the moment. But that would be enough if he can stay where he is. But there's still, what, uh, all just under halfway uh, remaining in this race. 21 minutes remaining out of this 45 minutes. You know, Jeremy, I would never argue with someone of your stature and status in the sport. And you say that Drake Kemper has the best seat in the house. I will argue that and say, in fact, we have the best seat in the house and the <laughs> fans all around the world watching this race have the best seat. Drake Kemper might be in a good position. We don't have $50,000 coming out. That, that is you. true. <laughs> I agree with you there. He might be leaving here with a bit of a payday, but we still have a great seat as we watch a really talented pack of drivers and, head down the back straight away here. Uh, yeah, and now Thomas Benaki has joined that train as well. We've now got an eight-car battle for the lead. Nico Rega is back up. It's up into the ninth position, having started way back in 16th. He's got a fair bit of ground to make up for those leaders, but he's got a fast car as Nico. He's a champion this season, and he's going to do his level best to latch on to this leading battle. Speaking about champions, a former series champion in Drake Kemper goes to the point. New leader. It's the number 99, the Lemons of Love sponsored MX-5 Cup car driven by Drake Kemper now to the front for the first time today he will see no one's rear bumper as he's out in front putting Lally who's led the majority of this race to this point back to second in third it looks like well on scoring it shows us Nathaniel Sparks but he's currently side by side with Todd Lamb let's see how they sort themselves out to through turn three that's kind of a, a bit of a silly phrase because they probably won't sort themselves out through turn three they'll continue to stay side by side Kemper out in front and then it's going to be Lally back to second Nathaniel Sparks solidly in the third position behind him, Todd Lamb in fourth, Celine Roland rounds out the top five, under 20 minutes to go here. Meanwhile, behind them, looks like uh, Thomas Bernacki and maybe uh, Henderson perhaps getting a little side-by-side. -side. Wow, it's going to be the Copeland car of not Ortiz, but his teammate. I want to say that's Henderson in the 97 diving down low. No, it's the 95 of Bernacki. I apologize. So Bernacki made a really aggressive move across the straightaway heading into the turning point for turn seven. Nothing really lost, nothing really gained there, but Bernacki uh, showing that he knows how to cut across the track and make some big moves. Oh, trouble for Lally. Lally slows to the inside as they head to turn 10. Lally is off the pace, and the sports car skateboarding vegetarian vegan out of it early in this one. Not sure what the issue is. Uh, he's slow off the pace, Jeremy. No idea what the issue is. Uh, clear some sort of mechanical problem there, I think, for Andy Lally, and he's uh, dropped out of contention. He did a good job there to get that car right out of the oh. way so as not to uh, impede anybody else, but what a heartbreaker for Andy. He was oh. he called in here with his good friend Todd Lamb, as you said, they're, uh, they're buddies there at the uh, local pizza joint in Atlanta area, and uh, they are part of the uh, trivia team uh, together occasionally. Uh, but uh, the trivia this weekend, it's, I don't know if it's something trivial. It certainly isn't trivial for Andy Lally, though, because $50,000 potentially has gone out of the window. Oh, that is such a heartbreak. I was so happy to see Andy Lally posting on social media that he was coming to compete in the MX-5 Cup Challenge this weekend. Such a cool guy, uh, a really good advocate of the sport, and he's out of it here with over 17 minutes still to go. That's a bummer. Now his Atlanta Speedworks team owner left to fend for himself here in third place as the Rookie of the Year, Celine Roland, throws it to the inside. Roland now up to second as he'll try to set his sights on his teammate, the number 99 of Drake Kemper. And folks, I know we have talked a lot about teams and how many cars are racing for six sideways and in the Atlanta, but at the end of the day, we saw it yesterday and you'll see it again here in roughly 15 minutes when we get down to the last lap. Team cars mean nothing. You're out there competing against any Anybody who's holding a steering wheel and it doesn't matter that Drake Kemper and Celine Roland drive for the same team it, none of that's gonna matter here in roughly 14 to 15 minutes because it's gonna be a no holds bar absolute knockout fight when we get to the white flag well it, it possibly is gonna matter because the teammates certainly can work together and uh, they you know the teammates uh, they want to if there are two teammates going for the win they want to make sure that they don't uh, take each other let, out it, yeah, yeah. let somebody else yeah. uh, sneak through and, and grab all the glory and the cash so uh, they will uh, they will try and work together as much as they can uh, but uh, at, at the end of the day it's, uh, there's a lot on the line here but that was a great lap by uh, Celine Roland he went all the way from fifth position up into second but Drake Kemper he is the man of the moment he finished in fifth position yesterday 
and Celine Roland having uh, been uh, involved in an incident yesterday he finished way down in 12th place so he's not really in uh, in in amongst the leaders for the 50,000, but he will certainly want to win this race. I'll tell you what, Jeremy, we're so fortunate this weekend to have such a great production uh, and, and images being displayed to us up here in the booth. And I love watching it. We just saw a few moments ago the pack head into turn number seven, and the precision that these drivers are, are executing moves with is uh, breathtaking. Uh, Celine Roland, Drake Kemper, as they are up there with a pack of cars breathing down their neck, they're so flawless at putting that left front BF Goodrich tire right on the outside curbing as they dive into the right-hander, turn number seven. They turn the steering wheel almost gracefully, slowly, one would even say. And it's just such precision that I think sometimes gets lost in this very physical style of racing. People don't realize this is a momentum based class. You don't have 7, 800 horsepower that are just screaming out of the rear wheels. These drivers have to be so quiet with their hands to not scrub away any speed because they can't afford to lose any momentum. Every rev, every rev, every bit of horsepower matters in these MX-5 Cup cars. We saw Tom Long out testing the 2019 package. They're going to get some more horsepower, but it's still a driver's race car, and it's so fun to watch uh, these men and women execute corners around this famous racetrack with such precision, even when you're dealing with the bumps, even when you're dealing with the slick spots. These guys and girls out here in MX-5 Cup are racing for $50,000, but they're doing it so well. The field comes across the start-finish line to complete yet another lap inside of 15 minutes to go, and you see some, uh, some sign language there from Todd Lamb communicating to Nathaniel Sparks the driver of the number eight right behind him. I think Todd Lamb was saying, hey, let's tuck back in, get back in line, and let's work on reeling in Kemper and Celine Roland. Uh, a little bit of hand movement there out of the left side of the 84. Can't say for certain that's what he was trying to communicate, but um, that's what it looks like at the moment. Brian Ortiz right there in the number four car, currently running uh, right behind Nathaniel Sparks. That would be for the fifth position. And then behind him should be his Copeland teammate. I do believe that's the number 95 of Thomas Bernacki. So uh, a lot of close competition here as they come out of turn five. They'll, they've actually now they've made their way out of turn six. They'll head to seven. Todd Lamb looking to the inside only for a moment. Thinks better of it. Does not attempt to pass. Oh boy, the gas can, uh, the gas flap is open on the number eight car. Uh, I'm not sure if that's worthy of a of a mechanical black flag. That's interesting. We just saw a great shot of the number eight come by and where you would put gas in at uh, your local pump or your local service station. That was kind of flapping in the breeze. So I don't know the regulations well enough to say that's going to be worthy of a mechanical black flag or not, but something to keep an eye on. Yeah, movable aerodynamic device, perhaps. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Five cars we got there uh, in this battle for the lead. Now they've just edged away just a little bit from the two cars behind them. Uh, and uh, right behind them also is the Thomas Bernacki and to tell you what Nico Riga isn't too far out of this game either he's uh, really charging hard the guy the fastest man on the track by a country mile by two seconds is John Dean who's up into 13th position still not going to be good enough for him but he is absolutely flying and showing what might have been today for John Dean from here in Sebring. Boy, Celine Roland and Todd Lamb making those BF Goodrich tires scream as they roll through the turn 15 and 16 complex right there. They were side by side. Their logic yeah. is eight tires must be better than four when getting through a corner, yeah. and they made it through cleanly, thankfully. Yeah. Now Nathaniel Sparks down to the inside as they head to corner 17. Right. That's the fight for second, taking it to Todd Lamb. Sparks is there, and Sparks is through. New driver to second place, and this is what Drake Kemper loves to see, Jeremy, because he can hit his marks, he can put his head down and drive away. That is exactly what Kemper wants. Great job as they come out of turn 17. Kemper out in front now with a little bit more room. Nathaniel Sparks in second as you'll see the leaderboard recycle. There you go. Sparks out of P2. Todd Lamb back to third. Lamb wants to make a move to the inside. No. Stays in line. Sparky still in second. Lamb in third. Celine Roland fourth. Brian Ortiz fifth. Brian Henderson sixth. Nico Rieger, the champion who suffered fourth gear issues yesterday, sits in seventh. Bernacki in eighth. Yoshida ninth. And John Dean, man, you hit on it earlier, Jeremy. He has done such a good job at re driving his way back from that drive-through penalty. He's up to 10th already. Really masterful drive by John Dean. Yes, that's absolutely right. He is absolutely flying. I mean, he's two seconds quicker than anybody else on a racetrack. But the guy to watch here at the moment is definitely Nico Riga. He's just turned his best lap of the race. He's in this lead pack now. And uh, they've actually closed up again on Drake Kemper. So all that battling behind uh, Drake Kemper 
uh, hasn't surprisingly allowed him to pull away and they've uh, they've closed that gap back down again and we've now got a what is that six or seven car train in the lead for the lead of this race with what 11 minutes remaining field coming out of the back side of the track now and Nathaniel Sparks has done a really good job at reeling in Drake Kempersley roll on in third and they make their way out of turn number 10 heading down and a little bit of dust getting kicked up right there on the exit uh, no change at the front yet uh, but boy business is starting to pick up as Todd <laughs> Lamb looking high looking yeah. low and a little bit of battling right there as well farther on back yeah you're right there's uh, all, all sorts of shuffling positions in there where is Nico Riga? He's, uh, he's, he's move, make, moving his way forward, isn't he? And uh, yeah, he's not there out he of is. this race. I mean, he, he started uh, way, way back in the 16th position. And he's now, he was, well, only three laps ago, he was a full three seconds away behind this whole train of cars. But that gap has been uh, has been completely eradicated. He's oh, right with them. Exactly, Jeremy. You hit the nail on the head. He is reeling in this four-car train. There he is right there in the white and yellow MX-5 Cup car. Rieger driving for Slipstream Performance, which is who got him to the championship top step this season. Uh, at the end of six race weekends, 12 rounds of camp championship competition. Sparky wanted to take a look. Not yet. Doing a really good job at staying right behind the number 99 of Drake Kemper as they roll through to complete another lap. And there it is, 10 minutes left to go in this race 35 minutes has flown by already and it's a six sideways podium if it were to fly the checkered flag right now of course we're 10 minutes still away from that point leaders heading down into corner number one to complete yet another lap so far 14 laps in the book Jeremy and I'll tell you what I was really impressed by IndyCar timing and scoring yesterday they timed it perfectly the field was coming out of turn 17 as the clock struck zero and the checkered flags were waving so you know when we say 45 minutes of racing we say 45 uh -huh. minutes of racing uh, looks like Celine Roland trying to get something happening right there but he's in such a tight spot Jeremy because Celine Roland sitting in third he might want to make a move for second but he's got to be careful because he's got Todd Lamb breathing down his back right behind him yeah I mean everybody has somebody breathing down their neck don't they this is really yeah, really tight racing that's in there. perfect we look there is a number zero one car uh, it's in the uh, fifth position, but he's uh, close up onto this pack, and he is very much part of the lead battle now. He's still got a couple of car lengths uh, 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 to the to the to the guards in front of him, but that means absolutely nothing in this series. You can no. easily make up a couple of car lengths. The, the cars sl slip and slide around, and uh, with when they're looking to make a move on on an, on the car in front of them, that's going to give an opportunity for the guy behind potentially to make a move as well. So lots of shuffling to come in this final. Eight and, a, eight and three quarter minutes of this race. I like how you put that. Everyone's breathing down somebody's neck in this series. It's kind of like being the only girl at a party. You're always in a corner. It doesn't feel right. You got someone breathing down your neck as they unwind. It's Drake Kemper still out in front. Nathaniel Sparks in second. Boy, uh, Celine Roland really is in a tough spot. He can't make anything happen because, well, he's got someone right behind him. That someone is this year's Masters class champion, uh, Todd Lamb in the number 84. And, and before Todd Lamb was a Masters age driver, he was the 2009 Series champion in MX5 Cup racing, so Todd Lamb knows these cars so well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, he does. Yeah, no one knows knows them better than he. You're absolutely right there. But uh, it's a battle uh, for for the fifty thousand dollars. It is also uh, for the lead of this race as well. Number ninety nine car of Drake Kemper, number eight car of Nate Sparks. Yesterday they finished in the fourth and fifth positions with Sparks ahead of Kemper. Now they're running first and second with Kemper crucially ahead of Sparks at this stage. But still plenty of time to go. Well, and I. I think it's so important to mention, Jeremy, we talked about a little bit yesterday, uh, second and third kind of fanning out a little bit. Roland wants to try and make something happen, but they all stay in single file. Long Road Racing does such a fantastic job building these race cars. Every car you see on track right now, we talked about yesterday, was born to be a street roadster that you would drive uh, to the movies, that you would drive wherever it may be on the road during the week or weekend, but they get shipped instead of instead of going to a Mazda dealership here in the U.S., they instead go to Long Road Racing in Statesville, North Carolina. And Nathaniel Sparks working with some help from one of his teammates to pass another six sideways driver. He got some help from Celine Roland as they both work their way around Drake Kemper. So Kemper falls from first back to third. But my point is that these cars were street roadsters. Long Road Racing does such a fantastic job to make them race cars. You're out of the door with one of these race cars, Jeremy, for just over $58,000. Folks, it's 50 grand to win this weekend. You could very closely be right there ready to buy another MX-5 Cup race car, and that is called financial investing. Well, that's exactly what John Dean did a couple of years ago. He won the overall championship in MX-5 Cup, the Battery Tender Series, uh, and rather than use the scholarship to move on uh, to something 
a higher echelon of the sport, right. he chose to, to spend the money on buying new race cars invest. and building invest. this six sideways team. It's what your parents are always telling you, folks. Invest, invest, invest. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, Jeremy's referring when he talks about using scholarship money. That's what Patrick Gallagher, our champion from last season, did. He took the $200,000 scholarship that Mazda Motorsports wrote him, and he took it to go compete in the what was Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge at IMSA, now becoming the Michelin Pilot Challenge. And he drove that number eight Multimatic Ford Mustang with his team co-owner, Chad McCombie, and they won at Watkins Glen this That's year. Right. So he is living proof that the Mazda scholarship money really, truly does help. Indeed, and Patrick, who won this event last season as well. Uh, so uh, we're looking for a potentially a third different winner here. It's Nate, Nate Sparks that won this event here in its inaugural running in 2016. Patrick Gallagher last season. And right now it's uh, Drake Kemper who leads this race, but uh, he's got Celine Roland, and oh, Sparky's gone to the front now. Oh, he has. Jeremy Sparky now leads with Celine Roland in second. They both got around Drake yeah. Kemper in turn one of this lap, so it's been a two position swing, but it's a six sideways podium if the checkered flag were to fly right now. Folks, we've got a lot of people all around the country and all around the world watching our broadcast of the Global MX5 Cup Challenge. I want to give a shout out. Mazda Motorsports does such a great job helping the advancement of young drivers, as Jeremy and I were just talking about. They helped another young man, Cedric the Intern. He's no longer uh, on the team. He's at back at home this weekend watching the racing live, but Cedric the intern was a big part of Mazda Motorsports during the summer months. He was at all the Road Dindy events, all the IMSA events, and I know he's back home right now watching our broadcast live. So Cedric, we miss you. Uh, we wish you were here, and we hope you're enjoying this racing as much as we enjoy calling it. Now Drake Kemper pops out to the inside on his teammate Celine Roland down into corner number one. Kemper is there. Roland's going to keep his foot in the gas on the high side. Jeremy, they get so close, they can almost tell what the other had for breakfast. They're door to door as they head into two. Sparks loves what he sees in his mirror. Kemper to the inside. Roll on to the outside. The track bends to the left. Kemper gets the position. Yeah, and right now it's Sparks who has the upper hand because he finished ahead of Kemper yesterday. Uh, Celine Roland really isn't in, is not in contention for the $50,000. And as these three are teammates, I'd be surprised if he wanted to, uh, I mean, he wants to win the race for sure, Absolutely. but he doesn't want to uh, upset either of the other two. Uh, at the same time, I mean, he wants to make sure that he keeps it clean now amongst these three teammates at the front of the field. Here is now a look into the inside again is Kemper. Kemper taking it okay, right to Sparky. He's getting the lead right back again. Oh, they're side by side. That chicane is beautiful. <laughs> that is one of the most unforgiving exits of a corner ever. I think coming out of turn seven at Sebring is a nightmare if you don't do it right. And it sounds like Lally with a stuck gearbox uh, again, stuck in fourth gear. That's the same issue that Nico Rieger suffered yesterday. We see Rieger fighting for fourth position right behind this lead pack, but it's the six sideways trio trying to decide the podium right now as they come through the backside of the track. Kemper now back to the front. Roland and Sparky door to door. No, Sparky's going to take the second position. So Roland sees the third spot once again. Sparky back to second. Kemper up to the point as they're coming around. Oh boy, Rieger drops both left side tires off on the exit of corner number 13. Kicks up a lot of dust, but keeps his foot in the gas and stays right in the and pointed in the right direction. Uh, coming down, Jeremy. Three minutes on the clock. We're probably going to see the white flag this time by with cars lapping in two and a half minutes. Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how long it takes them to get uh, from uh, turn uh, 16 all the way down the back straight into the start finish line. It's going to be close as to whether they're going to get another lap in. I think it's going to be perfect so, timing. Paul Blevins got the white flag in his hand, and he's going to wave it ferociously, signifying one lap to go here. Drivers making their way towards turn 17 now. This is now. Literally, literally for all the marbles here. For $50,000 for the winner, 20000 for second place, 10000 for third. It's Drake Kemper who leads coming down into turn 17 for what will be... And there's the flag, two minutes, 23. Yeah, it will be the white flag this time. There it is, white flag flies, folks, and my heart is pounding, and I don't even have any money on the line. Kemper at the line, Sparky behind him in second, but how will the order look in just about two and a half minutes when they get back around this 3.7 mile course? Kemper and Sparky respecting each other now in turn one, but they've got 16 corners left to do it. Celine Roland's lost the pack just a little bit, Jeremy, but I don't think it's gonna be that way for long. He's really good under braking here in turn number three. He closes back up. It's a six sideways yeah. top three as they run right now. I fancy Celine's just going to let those two go for it. He knows, he yep. will know, I am sure, that those two are going for the $50,000. Whichever one of these two, Kemper or Sparks, finishes ahead, is going to win the money this afternoon, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. 
They are. So it's, it's this is it. We've got uh, about two miles to go now. Fifty thousand dollars on the line. And remember, your boss, John Dean the second, he's not very happy. He was involved in an incident in the first ten minutes of this race. He had to serve a penalty that took him out of the running. Right now, he's currently scored in the tenth position. So the last thing he wants is to see his drivers wad up a bunch of race cars on the final lap. So if you're not racing for the money, race to make sure John Dean doesn't kick your butt when you get back to the trailer. Now they fan out, trying to make it three wide. Sparky to the inside. That's for the lead. Sparks now back to the front. Kemper to second, but he's going to do a really good job. Tried the crossover there, Ooh. Jeremy. Out of eight and nine. Oh, this is good racing right now. Roll on. I think you played it perfectly. Roll on is right there waiting to see what happens. He's uh, blocking every line he possibly can there. Sparks having made, the, made that uh, pass into turn 10. He pushed the uh, Drake Kemper car right to the outside and off the edge of the race right there. That's going to be that's good tight racing. Hey, look, there's a lot of money on the line. You just got to let him go for it and see what they can do. Hopefully they'll keep it clean. There's definitely a touch from the nose of Kemper onto the rear of Sparks as they head into the Jean de Bian curves. Oh, it's like a 1980s music workout video. It's getting physical out there as they head into turn 16 for the final time. They'll unwind the steering wheel and make the run down the back straight away. You called it, Jeremy. Kemper put a bumper on Sparky, but Sparky kept his foot in the gas down the back straight away for the final time. He's uh, driven these cars for a long, long time. He knows how to win. Can he do it now? Just one corner to go. $50,000. It's a lot of money and not a lot of time left. Kemper looking to the inside. Sparky defense. It's not over. Not by a mile. Celine Roland goes around the high side. It's a drag race for a second. Sparky likes his odds. He's got to keep his foot in the gas. In and out of the final corner. Sparky second at the white flag. He's going to lead it at the finish line. Sparks is your winner here in Sebring. Kemper comes home second and completing the six sideways performance podium. The rookie of the year, Celine Roland, finishes in third. Jeremy, that was impressive. Uh, and uh, for the second day in a row, we see the race decided on the final lap of this race. It wasn't the final corner. Well, it was decided the final corner because he wasn't able to make a pass today. But what a great race that was. And even for fourth plate position, the, the uh, zero one one car uh, of, uh, of uh, Nico Riga and Todd Lamb, number 84, absolutely side by side across the finish line. And in that battle as well was Thomas Bernacki, car number 95. But it is Nate Sparks. He, yesterday, he uh, had a uh, fourth place finish. And today he has the win, and that I am pretty sure, unofficially, certainly, but that is going to win him the top prize today. John? Kemper in second place will take the $20,000 uh, to second today, second on the weekend, I reckon. And I think it's going to be the 84, the Lamb car, that takes the $10,000. He was in that group in the secondary group that were battling for fourth on down, that was led home uh, by the 0 1 of uh, Nico Rega. And. Lamb coming home in fifth. He must have been licking his lips to see if the if Sparks and Kemper guys got together. Yeah, Lamb and Bernacki there were, were separated by 0 0.0364 as they crossed and the line. And that was $10,000 worth of separation. So. And Indeed check this so, out, guys. Because if that, if that had been that point three the other way around, it would be Bernacki with the 10 grand. You've got the, you've got the six sideways uh, <laughs> whole family out there doing burnouts and celebrating. John Dean finishes 10th, but he's still out there doing donuts. This is fun. Yeah, and he turned the fastest lap uh, at a 229. Zero, uh, which was streets faster than everybody else, John Dean. He comes away with a with a tenth place finish, but uh, he's got, uh, as you say, the three cars uh, dominates the podium here for six sideways racing. Also, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth as well. So the seven cars are all uh, finishing this race. Guys, thanks so much for letting me hang out with you, Jeremy. As always, such a pleasure to work with you. John, really can't wait to hear both you guys call the Michelin Encore here in a little while. Great racing as always. Go get some MX money out. Cup. Yeah, we're going to go to Victory Lane. You guys have a great day up here. Thanks so much for letting me hang out. Tony Laporte uh, doing a grand job on the two races uh, this weekend. A $50,000 pass on the final lap of the MX5 Global Cup, the Battery 10 MX5 Global Cup race here at Sebring. Jeremy Shaw, that <laughs> I mean, that had everything. The yeah. main protagonist from the first race getting together took the, both of them out of it. Then Andy Lally looked to be cruising towards a big pay day, stuck in fourth gear. Andy will be distraught at yeah. that. And then Sparks and Kemper. In some ways, I think that's really good that those two guys have been such a big part of this championship, fighting yes. it out, and it was winner takes all. It was. Uh, yeah, that, is, that is the way to finish it. So uh, that's the second time that uh, Sparky has won 
this event. He won it uh, in its inaugural running at what is now WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca in California. And he's won it on the other coast as well here at Sebring International Raceway. So a great performance by him, particularly as he qualified and started way back in the 11th position. It took him no time at all yeah, to get up good. into contention. And for Andy Lally, yeah, heartbreak. But uh, even... even even with that, with that problem, he was he was going to have a hard time winning the race because uh, Sparky and uh, and uh, Kemper had both finished ahead of Lally yesterday, uh, and they were ahead of him or right with him when uh, Andy Lally had that problem. But uh, a great motor race. Fifty thousand dollars going to Sparky, Nathaniel Sparks, by 0 0.093 of a second. Drake Kemper gets the 20 grand in second. And as far as the 10, 10 grand for third overall at the weekend, again, less than half a tenth of a second between Lam and Bernacki in fifth and sixth position. So it is the 84 car of Lam uh, that takes that 10,000. That's all unofficial at the moment. The big checks are being written out at the moment what a fabulous opening to our day of racing here we'll be back in about an hour's time with the countdown to green for the michelin imza encore here at sebring international speed uh, raceway for jeremy shaw and tony laporta and john hindoff thanks for joining us and join us again in just under 60 minutes on rs2 imza radio